Hello, my friends. So excited to join you from across the pond and to share with you today on contextual intelligence. Um, and we'll have to do a little bit of translating together uh, because I am uh, over on this side of the pond. And so the realities here are different. Uh, and so we'll have to do some actual contextual intelligence to translate those, those differences. But my mentor and I, Leonard Sweet, we call contextual intelligence the ancient secret to mission on the front lines. Uh, this is where my doctoral research uh, has come from. And, and just personally, you should know that uh, through failure, um, through, through not having uh, contextual intelligence in many cases in the practice of ministry, um, started to, to, to learn about this and think about it. And then through training others all across the United States and even a little bit on the other side of the pond, um, just started to notice this distinct kind of intelligence that lots of um, more entrepreneurial pioneer type folks uh, in churches uh, used called contextual intelligence. So this is something I'm really passionate about and I'm so grateful to be able to, to share about it with you today. Uh, COVID-19 was kind of this first global black swan, right? Uh, that, that just changed the face of the world um, for a significant period of time. Some say, you know, we're, we're still in a kind of a COVID era, if you will, um, but it forced us uh, in, in, into some change and to think about things in a different way. Um, and so how do we assess our context uh, in all these significant changes so that we can be faithful to Jesus and fruitful uh, in, in the harvest of the kingdom in this time? So I believe the first thing that a leader has to do is actually put a pin in the map uh, for a group of folks to be able to kind of say, here's where I think we are. I think this is a, a picture of our reality uh, to lead a group of people to discern that a picture of reality together, and then based on that reality, act in faithful ways. Uh, so just to kind of describe some of the changes that we're facing, uh, and again, there's going to have to be some translation here, but as you look out over this crowd in 2005, you see uh, uh, these people gather to hear the Pope's kind of inaugural address here. How many phones can you count out in that crowd? Just take a minute and, and note how many you see there. Be great if you want to um, just pop it in the chat or uh, take a little note for yourself. Um, so there's the obvious one in the front there, the flip phone, right? And um, it's cool if some of y'all still have a flip phone, that's fine. Uh, flip phones are making a comeback. Um, but but you can kind of count, uh, uh, not, a, not, not many, we can kind of count them on you know, one or two hands, the amount of phones we can see there. So let's jump forward eight years to 2013. How many phones do you count now, right? So the fact that um, most human beings walk around with a supercomputer in our pocket that uh, can access all the world's knowledge and data, um, you know, with the, with the words, hey, Siri, um, that, that's a game changer. Right. And Manuel Castells is a sociologist. He's written three big, massive books to, to describe this. Um, and it's kind of a hazing ritual for my students at the seminary. But he described what he called a network society. And there's this movement uh, into a, a, the, the, the uh, industrial revolution kind of structured, hierarchical, neighborhood based kind of society. And now we find ourselves in a network society. So these devices that we carry around are not neutral. They change the way we fall in love. They change the way we work. They change the way we worship. They change the way we literally think. And there's a neuroscience that shows that uh, these devices actually can rewire our brains. So this is one of the changes that we have to contend with uh, in the 21st century. We also have to contend with this decline in affiliation not just in the church, but in institutions in general. Uh, people are kind of pushing against this post-affiliation, this new protestant protesting against institutions, and one of those being the church. But there's this really hopeful sign of a rise in spirituality and a spiritual openness um, uh, in, in a generic sense. There's this terminology that we use on our side of the pond to talk about the spiritual but not religious so I don't want to be, you know, pegged as a religious person, but I'm open um, spiritually. Um, and, and so current attitudes towards church 
again, do some translation here, but on our side of the pond, and we know that that you are from our future, <laughs> um, literally not not just time zone wise, but literally from our future in the the reality of secularization, uh, and in uh, post Christendom, um, and I think um, I love the language of Charles Taylor in his book A Secular Age. Uh, he describes the imminent frame, which I think in Sweden and other parts um, uh, over on your side of the pond that the imminent frame is kind of the dominant uh, uh, situation. Uh, where and, and in the imminent frame, Taylor says, we don't even believe in a divine entity that can break in and, and intervene in our, in, our, in our world, right? So that's happening here slower on our side of the pond. Uh, but there's about 20% of people who attend church regularly, lower than that in most places. There's about 20% of people who don't attend church but say that they do. Can you believe people lie about their church attendance, right? Um, uh, and then there's about 40% who have no interest in the church, won't want to walk in on a Sunday morning, will not walk in no matter how we do it, no matter how great it is. Uh, they're just not going to, they're just not going to come. There's lots of factors for this. There's those duns, people who've been harmed by the church, bad Christians happen to good people and they're over it. Uh, there's uh, the the fact that we don't have blue laws here in the United States anymore, where it used to be the only thing you could do on Sundays was go to church. That's done. Now we have a seven day work week uh, where we work seven days, gig economy, younger folks working lots of jobs, multiple jobs, trying to pay off educational debt. And then we've got, um, you know, the the youth soccer leagues and football and different things that all compete in that Sunday morning space. And uh, about 40% of our population is actually working. And yet we've got all our eggs in the Sunday morning worship basket, putting so much energy and time and resources into this one thing where we know about half the population is not going to come to no matter how good we do it. Um, so if we could kind of describe these changes that we're going through, this liminality that we're in now, what was once a lush kind of rainforest uh, is now a desert. So this is a change of ecosystems. Uh, this is uh, what Gil Rendell, he's a Methodist scholar, talks about an aberration. The church as we know it was formed in this aberrant time, this not the normal, this aberration. Uh, and you can think of that as this jungle. A, a desert is also an ecosystem. It's a very different kind of an ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, now we have to figure out a new way to live. We have to figure out how do we get water out of a cactus, uh, right? What are the dangerous things here? Where, how do we find the oasis of the spirit and uh, draw water from that well? Um, so these are not technical problem, technical solution uh, situation. This is an adaptive challenge that's before us. And this is where contextual intelligence is, it comes in and being important. It's almost like we've been prepared for a world that no longer exists. Um, I am a seminary professor, so I'm kind of throwing rocks at myself here. Uh, but I hear students, you know, graduate seminary, we get out into the world and we say, the seminary, my training did not prepare me for this, right? The, the world is so different uh, and we're still educating and and, and orienting and for this world that no longer exists. Uh, you know, for one, um, a lot of people graduate and think, hey, I'm going to go, you know, be a pastor of a congregation and then there's going to be people there. Well, that's not a given, right? Now we have to be just as much missionary as we are um, uh, um, shepherding an existing thing. We can think of it as this kind of a kind learning environment. Uh, what we're, we're familiar with that. That's kind of the ecosystem we live in where deliberative practice and instinctive pattern recognition and narrow repetitive skills are important. That's like playing chess or, or golf or, or uh, these games where we know the rules of the game and there's boundaries and we make a move and we get feedback from that. But now we're in a wicked learning environment where we need a range of skills, knowledge from multiple fields that we can apply to our situation. This requires adaptation constantly. We do something, we, we don't know the feedback's not immediate. Is this really working? So we have to iterate, prototype, try stuff. We need outside experience. So it's like we're playing alien tennis, <laughs> not chess or, or or golf, but if we don't even know who we're playing with, what are the rules, how many balls are in the field? Maybe this would be a better metaphor today would be pickleball. 
in the United States, pickleball is one of the fastest growing kind of sports, but there's this change, right? Uh, generationally speaking, most of our congregations are made up of this builder generation. Um, and then every generation that kind of drops in half. Uh, Love at Weems talks about the death tsunami that's coming uh, for the church. Uh, that when these folks graduate and get to go be with Jesus in the new creation, uh, that we're, we're coming into a crisis, a death tsunami, he calls it. There's about 10% of Christian 20-somethings who say what they have a resilient faith. And there's about two-thirds in the U.S. of 18 to 29-year-olds who grew up in church but would draw uh, as soon as they um, uh, uh, become adults. And over on our side of the pond, we saw for the first time the Gallup poll that the United States became less religious uh, than, than religious. We have less people participating in some kind of uh, religious community uh, than the majority. And that, that was a first time occurrence. Um, and I know that that's been um, something that's been your reality for, for um, longer. But the good news in all this is that the, there's not uh, disinterest in spirituality or an openness to explore kind of spiritual practices. In fact, only 22% of the nuns, the fastest growing category in the world, uh, list not believing in God as their most important reason for their lack of affiliation. Uh, there's very few in this group who, uh, Siri jumped in there, are, are atheistic. Um, and so there's some helpful kind of research coming out. This all coming out of the Springtide research uh, that 58% of young people ages 13 to 25 don't want to be told answers about their faith. Um, they want to discover their own answers. And so we have to shift from monologue to dialogue. People don't want to be indoctrinated and told, you need to believe like this, or we don't need to be um, answering questions for people that they're not actually asking. But we have to kind of present the gospel uh, and create conversations around Jesus with spiritually open people. Uh, and 55% of young people don't attend religious services because they feel they can't be who they are. They're going to be judged. They're going to be um, uh, uh, not accepted. And so they just don't come at all. There's an interesting thing coming out of this research concept called faith unbundled. And that describes how young people are increasingly kind of constructing their faith by combining all kinds of uh, different elements and practices and community. So I want to spend a little time on this because I think um, for us to be contextually intelligent, we have to understand uh, that the hallmarks of engaging young people are going to be curiosity, wholeness, connection, and flexibility. Now, I don't know about you, but I know for me, for the Methodists, for the Salvation Army, <laughs> for that the, there's a lot of structure and rigidity and like hierarchy. And so we're not necessarily set up for curiosity, wholeness, connection, flexibility, right? But we have to adapt um, to this way of being in the world today. So coming back to this idea of the springtide research and faith unbundled, uh, this is Lady Gaga, if you, if you didn't know who this is, and I just want to use her as a little case study to describe what faith unbundled means. And for generations, uh, faith was kind of bundled together in what's been called this religious identity cocktail, where you had believing, belonging, behaving, all kind of integrated uh, together. So you you uh, believed right? So I said the creed, I became a member, and then I could belong in the community, and then I had to behave in, in the community. Um, now, what, what we're doing with things like Fresh Expressions and micro church and pioneering movements is we're flipping that, and we're creating community of belonging first, and in that belonging space, at the, at the pace of grace, people come to believe and their behaviors change over time, but we've we've almost flipped and reversed that. But in the um, faith unbundled, these things have been broken apart, um, and and they may or may may not be connected at all. So I can believe over here, but I, I I may or may not adhere to any kind of you know behavior, or I'm just kind of cobbling together these different ideas. So if you think of Lady Gaga, for instance, who was raised a practicing Catholic, uh, she. Um, is, is she worships and prays. She gets her folks together in a circle and they hold hands and they pray in Jesus name before they do a performance. She also kind of schedules her tours based on uh, astrological charts. So that would be a little weird for some of us. 
but this is a direct quote of something that she said. I hope I'm teaching people to worship themselves. Um, now we may have different theologies around that in in, in this group, um, but but for many of us, we would think um, that uh, do we want people to know their sacred worth and great value and beloved of God? Yes. Do we want people to worship themselves? Uh, probably not, right? Um, so that's called idolatry. Um, so um, when you don't have the this sacred community, so we've got these ideas like a churchless Christianity where I can just be a Christian uh, without having to be baptized into a community. Um, and 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 we know that that it's fundamentally to be a Christian is to be baptized into a body of believers. Now that doesn't necessarily need need to look like a denomination or a church inherited way that we've thought about that, but some kind of community where we're living together in a rule of life and we're trying to follow Jesus at some level uh, and and putting those things back together into that religious identity cocktail. So spiritual seekings happening everywhere. It often lacks these critical, sacred, communal relationships, and people just kind of throw together things and create their own spirituality. So what we're doing in a contextually intelligent way of being church, I want to use just one example, like fresh expressions. Uh, we think of people in a network society, they don't necessarily connect based on uh, who, who our next door neighbor is, right? Uh, in, in a neighborhood society, we, we knew our neighbor uh, we had relationship with our neighbor. We borrowed sugar from our neighbor. Uh, we we our neighbor borrowed our lawnmower. Um, our neighbor has had my lawnmower for two weeks. Anybody had that neighbor? Um, those kind of things. Now, um, our zip code or our 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 geography doesn't necessarily determine uh, the relational networks that we'll participate in. But people gather around these practices in these kind of domains of life. That, that you see illustrated here. So people may be really passionate in that healing domain about social justice or political movements. Uh, they may be in that nourishing space in like a rural context where we're fo focused on uh, food, farming, sustainability, and place economy. Uh, and and um, people are passionate about that and forming relationships around health and well-being or fitness and sport. And so while we may or may not know our neighbor, we get together around these practices, these, these hobbies, interests, passions, uh, and we more build relationships. So what we're doing with Fresh Expressions uh, is, is to have contextual forms of church to be contextually intelligent uh, is we, we go out and we join those already life-affirming things. So if people are passionate about social justice, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit's already there involved in that. And we're trying to go out and join what the Holy Spirit's doing in the world. If people are passionate about food, farming, sustainability, we know God's involved in that. We want to go out there and join what God is doing in the context. In these little new Christian communities, they look a little bit weird for some. They're organic. They build up out of these relationships through listening and loving. But they spring up right in the context. Uh, they take on the language and the practices and the, the rhythms of the context um, and we um, uh, create community in that way. So this idea of contextual intelligence, I want to just do a little bit of uh, biblical kind of grounding it in scripture. Uh, and Jesus had this wonderful saying, you have a saying that goes red sky at night, sailor delight, red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. You find it easy enough to forecast the weather. Why can't you read the signs or the simeon, uh, the, the, the signs of the times? So you can tell weather patterns and you can see when something's coming, but do you have this kind of seeing, this kind of intelligence, this kind of vision that you 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 understand the context around you, which was one of Jesus' favorite things was to teach his disciples, pay attention to the context. Um, so how can we grow in our ability to read our context and to in intentionally kind of engage our communities for Christ? Um, this is where we think CQ is a helpful tool. And it comes from these two Latin words that we kind of bring together, uh, the word for context to weave together uh, and, and uh, to enter or between uh, to choose to read. So contextual intelligence is literally about reading between the lines. Uh, it's, it's about seeing the, the spirit, uh, 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 the, the, the things of God behind the things that we see.
right? It's about having those eyes to see, ears to hear that Jesus is always talking about. And the the larger kind of macro and micro level things that make a context uh, what it is. Um, Alan Hirsch has this great quote in um, uh, Red Skies, contextual intelligence, looking to find the threads of meaning and of God's will and what seems like uh, chaos in the current kind of liminality of the of the um, times. Um, now, uh, like many things, the world takes our best lines as the church and, and takes our best stories and tells them better than we do. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit of the kind of the academic um, origins of this concept of contextual intelligence. So there's two Harvard researchers uh, in, in our side of the pond. Harvard's a very prestigious kind of um, school. Uh, but these two, Mayo and Nahira, they, they uh, studied the canon of business legends um, uh, across uh, the, the, the last hundred years. Uh, and they, they um, kind of identified in their book, in their time, uh, that that um, these leaders had a distinct kind of way that 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 this distinct kind of intelligence that to lead. All those leaders were very different in how they led and their personalities and their different ideas, but each one seemed to have what they called this contextual intelligence, a sensing capability, uh, a sensitivity to uh, contextual factors. Now they're obviously using it in the growth of business, uh, but we're using it to think about how we grow. Uh, the church and how we uh, participate in the, the reign of God in the earth. And so it's bringing together this idea of leadership, energizing a community of people toward accomplishing some shared mission and contextual intelligence, which is the ability to accurately diagnose the context and make correct decisions regarding uh, what to do. And again, how are these related? Well, if the first task of a leader is to paint an accurate picture of reality, uh, contextual intelligence is uh, is significant in that the first place that we see this in the Bible is in First Chronicles twelve thirty two. There's this mysterious tribe called Issachar, uh, and there we see in that situation, First Chronicles, David is taking over leadership as king of Israel from Saul. So there's this transition, this kind of liminality, uh, and and. Uh, all the tribes are bringing weaponry and people power and 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 uh, provisions. The tribe of Issachar shows up, kind of empty-handed, but what they bring uh, to to the to the situation is the ability to read the signs of the times and to know what to do. Uh, so there's this distinct kind of intelligence that they have. It's the ability to read what's happening and know what to do. Uh, we see Issacharians across Scripture. Uh, like Tola. So we get this story about Abimelech, this crazy king. He's killing everybody. He's a wild man. A woman throws a stone off a tower and kills him. And he's narcissistic and arrogant and says, you know, run me through. So nobody says I was killed by a woman. Then you get right after his story in Judges 10 and Judges 9. In Judges 10, we hear about Tola, who gets two verses. And Tola judged for 23 years. So you get like this one year reign of this maniac, whole chapter devoted to him. And then we hear about Tola, uh, who, who quietly, uh, humbly uh, knows how to read the signs and knows what to do. Uh, this Issacharian who quietly leads for 23 years, the people of God. So we might see and draw from that two different kinds of leadership uh, uh, styles, if you will. Uh, positional hierarchical individualistic approach you know it's all about me i'm in power so do what i say abimelech uh, then there's this shared adaptive collectivistic approach um, uh, that that tola kind of brings uh, and you can see that kind of contrasted uh, when moses blesses these two tribes the zebulans and the issacharians um, uh, uh, the 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 uh, two tribes that kind of work together. Actually, they're one of the only um, biblical brothers that actually work together. Uh, biblical brothers, um, you hear uh, not not great things, right? From Cain and Abel uh, to Jacob and Esau uh, fighting and quarreling and killing each other. Uh, these two brothers actually collaborate and connect and work together that become these two tribes that continue that kind of strategic partnership. Uh, Zebulun and, and uh, Issachar. 
And so the Iskarians have this kind of domestic calm, peaceful disposition, willingness uh, to to uh, work. Um, they're in Jewish scholarship today. Iskar is known for insightful study of Torah. And uh, Iskar and Zebulun work together to kind of resource each other in this shared kind of way, um, where um, Zebulun's kind of this merchant who kind of resources and funds the Iskarians who kind of study scripture uh, in, in the times, and they read that together, God's story, and how the story of the world is unfolding uh, to, to help guide where things are going. So there's really these two major components of contextual intelligence. There's this reading of the signs, so being able to read the simeon and the changing uh, conditions, and then knowing what to do. So you can think of that as evaluation, implementation. So in a, a adaptive leadership, uh, evaluation is really, really important. Sometimes we skip over it or we don't do a good job of really sensing uh, and evaluating our context. And then based on that evaluation, uh, action that, that's based on a, a right reading of what's happening in the world uh, in, in the, the time. So reading the, the signs and times for Christians has these two big kind of ideas. There's a hermeneutic. Um, so we study scripture. Um, and we 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 need to understand God's story and where we are in that story through really uh, understanding biblical texts. And then there's semiotics, uh, where we're studying the signs and symbols of culture, of the world, of the changing kind of patterns of life. And when we read those two things together, it creates this kind of mandorla, uh, the sweet spot, where a faithful reading of scripture and a faithful reading of the world, uh, there's this crossover that kind of happens, and that 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 place where that uh, overlap happens, that's the contextual intelligence kind of sweet spot in there. Every context is is like a tell. Um, it, the, if you think of a tells like archaeological sites, and there's layers of story and sedentary like history and meaning. Uh, and we we have to be kind of like archaeologists um, of, of our tells, of our communities. What are the layers of story and history here? Um, what has God been up to? And what is God doing? And what is God calling into the future? Uh, um, and, and CQ gives us kind of the spade to, to dig into our tell and understand our communities in a deeper way. Uh, there's this great, um, he's called the Black Leonardo, George Washington Carver, uh, who said this wonderful line, if anything, uh, anything will give up its secrets if you love it long enough. And he's somebody who um, studied peanut, the little peanut, and found hundreds of uses for the peanut. Uh, and if you really sit with something and study it uh, and, and, and love it, uh, it reveals itself to you, right? And so contextual intelligence, some of that, the place is our teacher, uh, we're, we're, we're sitting uh, and, and examining and uh, assessing with our eyes wide open. Um, uh, we're reading the context. This is, again, one of Jesus' key um, teachings to his disciples. He was always saying, look around, take note of the fig tree. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 you, you see that the, the season's coming, uh, read the signs of the times, right? Uh, he was a master semiotician uh, who didn't necessarily do ministry in the inherited context, like not just at the temple or the tabernacle or, or the uh, synagogue, but he was out in the world and teaching the disciples to, to be in the world and to really look, to learn, to situate themselves. Some of his favorite words, look, observe, consider, behold, watch, right? See the birds of the air, uh, see what they're doing. Uh, look at the, the 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 lilies. Consider them. Um, notice your context. Pay attention to what's happening. Um, so listening, paying attention, is an act of uh, intentionally engaging communities for Christ. Um, uh, it's it's um, following Jesus' uh, uh, command and teaching to do that. To really pay attention, and a gospel that's not contextualized is not faithful to the gospel, right? The gospel is word made flesh, right? So uh, logos, divine truth, moves into the neighborhood, takes on flesh, tabernacles among us, right? 
Um, so the gospel itself, the person, the incarnate Lord Jesus, um, it is a contextualized expression of the universal truth of God, right? And so it, it, a church that's not a contextualized expression of its community, of, it, of its time, of the people who dwell there, that's not faithful to the gospel. Uh, that's an abandonment of the gospel. And uh, we like to think about good news having both a somewhereness and a somebodyness. Um, what we mean by that, the gospel has a terroir, a somewhereness. Uh, this, this is a, a word that describes the, the taste or the environmental factors uh, that, that um, grow in a specific habitat. Um, so if you think about a, a wine has a certain terroir, a taste, or a chocolate, or a coffee has a certain terroir, when you taste it, you can know, you know, that wine was produced here, or that coffee comes from this area. There's a somewhereness, these environmental factors that create the flavor, the taste of that thing. Uh, and then there's a somebodyness to every community. And our great prophet over here on our side of the pond was the, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who taught us this principle of somebodyness that everybody is a somebody, everybody has dignity and worth. Uh, and, 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 and when people know that um, and, and, and know their worth in, in Christ, for instance, uh, it changes the course of their lives. And so good news has to, has to meet in those two ways, right? There has to be a somewhereness to the good news. It has to make sense in the context of the people where it is. And it has to be good news for the people. It has to validate their somebodyness. It has to help them understand who they are in, in Christ and build uh, uh, from that core identity. And so when you think about the incarnation, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Um, uh, he goes particular to get universal. The universal one takes on particularity, right? Jesus didn't just love people in general right? He loved real people with specific names and specific struggles and specific hopes, uh, real people in a, in a real time, particular persons with real names and real situations, people who were both very good, made in the image of God, and who carried wounds of, of original trauma, uh, and people with real assets and real liabilities, and the gospel takes on particularity in the midst of that. So here's my last thing I want to share with you, just to give you a helpful little kind of tool or framework for contextual intelligence. Uh, and this comes right out of Paul's hymn that's preserved in Philippians 2, uh, that we believe this is a, a song, a, a hymn that was sung by the people that probably predated Paul, probably one of the oldest pieces of the New Testament. Uh, N.T. Wright and other biblical scholars um, believe this, that the, the first Christians kind of carried their Christology uh, in this hymn. Uh, and it's a hymn about descent and, and ascent, Jesus emptying himself, moving down into the world, into the pain, redeeming it from inside, resurrection, ascension, uh, healing uh, the world and the uh, uh, embodiment of a new community. So if you think about that mind of Christ, what if that's not just, um, you know, a nice song, but but what if that's a way of life when Paul is saying, have the same mind in you uh, that is in Christ? What if that is uh, the, the, the contextual intelligence, right? What if that is the way that Christians are supposed to think and live? So the Bible doesn't just tell us what to think about if anything is lovely and true and pure. But the Bible tells us literally how to think. And this mind of Christ might be a framework to help us think about our communities in a different way. So in this passage, there's the self-emptying of Jesus, the kenosis, right? The one who in the very form of God doesn't grasp the quality of God as something exploited, but he empties himself. There's this incarnation, this incarnate, this enfleshment of in, in, in the world. There's the cross. Right. So Jesus takes all the pain, and the brokenness and the woundedness of the world into himself. There's the tomb time. So there's that period of death. Uh, and the disciples are like, hey, we thought Jesus was the guy. Clearly, he was not because he got crucified. So we're going back to Emmaus or we're going back fishing or we're holed up in a little room 
with the windows bar and the door lock. So there's this this tomb time, this liminality uh, that that often happens uh, in our lives, where we have to have this the spirit show up and intervene as we try to create a new thing. So we try to engage our communities. We try to be contextually intelligent in the way of Jesus. Then there's the resurrection. Jesus kind of shows up, breathes on the disciples, fills them with the spirit, sends them in mission. Uh, and then there's the ongoing community that's created, the body of Christ in the world, this new creation uh, that, that now Jesus is, is he's ascended and he sits on the throne of the cosmos as the wound bearing King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he's also in flesh and embodied in the world today through the church. Or uh, what I love what Alan Hirsch talks about in the Apest in Ephesians 4, it takes all of us to make one Jesus. All of us as apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers embodied together as the body of Christ make one Jesus, this new creation thing. So what I'm, we're doing with the contextual intelligence is what if this is literally a series of movements for how us for how we can think about uh, our communities. So that first movement is that self-emptying movement. It's that unlearning. Um, it's it's being able to to come into our community with soft eyes, not with the hard-eyed surety like the Pharisees had. Right? They thought they knew everything and that they rejected Jesus. But this humble way of kind of being in the world, where we're unlearning old ways of thinking and old models and, and immersing ourselves in our context. So contexts are, are not so much like clocks that move with a, you know, a, 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 a mechanical kind of way. Contexts are more like cloud formations uh, that just when we think we have an accurate picture of the, the cloud formation, atmospheric changes kind of come along and, and change the formation, right? So we, we can't fully know uh, our community. We are constantly learning to know our community with those soft eyes as a learner. And then we immerse ourselves in our context with real people, uh, learning their real names and spending time inhabiting places and praying over places. Uh, and then we mind the gaps. What are the pain points uh, in, in the world? Where are the, those crosses, right? Where there's food insecurity, where are there gaps between the fullness of the kingdom uh, and, and what is our current reality? And we always find the spirit at work and moving in those gaps, bringing healing and renewal. And how do we join into the gaps, the fragments uh, that we see in our community? We're always going to go where we have that hit the wall moment, uh, that disorientation, that liminality where we you know, think we're doing something and it kind of seems to be falling apart. Or we're trying to start a new church and nobody's showing up or we have a, a leader who goes rogue on us or there's a mutiny, uh, many things, right? But there's this period of disorientation that we'll always go through if, if we follow the spirit in our community uh, to create new things and, and to share the gospel. And the spirit shows up in that tomb time, that disorientation leads us to new discoveries right? So that's the resurrection moment, right? Where God shows up uh, in a new way or shows us a new direction or in a new person or a new kind of door opens. Uh, and we, we find the risen Jesus right there in the disorientation, moving us, moving us forward. And then through this journey, usually something is new is created through embodiment. So that could be a new us. Uh, that could be a new ministry that we start or a new uh, some kind of program that heals the gaps of some kind of pain point in our community, or that could literally be a new church, a, a fresh expression of church or a micro community. Something gets embodied as we as we follow the spirit through this journey of self-emptying, immersing and minding the gaps. Uh, and and uh, the, the spirit creates something new uh, in us and through us. So, hey, I know that was a lot of stuff, um, but uh, I'm, I get really passionate about contextual intelligence. I've been so grateful to be able to share this uh, with you, and I'm excited to, to have some uh, conversations about it. So thank you, and uh, may God bless your day.